you very much, um, Dr. Liu. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to talk about trustworthy AI to this audience. Um, I do want to point to the short little paper that came out last fall on trustworthy AI, which captures in words what I'm going to convey today um, out loud. So AI, as we know, already achieves or exceeds human performance. Um, they are the vision systems of our cars of tomorrow and some of our cars of today. Um, we interact with um, home devices um, through speech recognition and uh, there is AI inside those devices. And of course, we all know the famous um, beating of the Master Go player a few years ago by an AI system built out of reinforcement learning and deep learning and other AI techniques. AI has the promise of benefiting humanity and society. They will drive our cars of tomorrow. They already are diagnosing uh, whether a, um, an X-ray or an MRI tells you whether you have cancer or not. And they are ostensibly um, promised to be used in making fairer and more equitable um, decisions about people in courts and in the hiring process. So all of the promises of AI sound pretty phenomenal. We've already seen what AI systems can do, and we really do look for what more AI can do for humanity and society. However, as we all know, um, there's a question of why we should trust these AI-based systems. After all, we know if we just put some graffiti on a stop sign or duct tape, then the machine learning classifier will say it's not a stop sign. And then your car goes, your self-driving car goes through the intersection and you die. We also know that it's very easy to add noise to an image that will fool a classifier into saying that a benign um, a lesion is malignant. We also have very famous <clears throat> um, articles that show that <clears throat> some of the court uh, systems AI systems or machine learning systems or classification systems used in the court, criminal court system in the United States can show racial bias. And we also know that industry has actually tried to use AI for recruiting, um, but have, these tools have been shown to be biased against women. So the bottom line is we see the promise of AI but how can we deliver on this promise and address these scenarios that have life critical consequences for people and society? In short, how can we achieve trustworthy AI? And I asked this question, I actually asked this question a few years ago, primarily to spur the various communities who have been interested in building AI, interested in trustworthy computing, my own background in specification and verification to come together and see what together we can do to try to address this question. This is a long-term research agenda because of all those other research agendas I mentioned already like trustworthy computing or formal methods are still ongoing. Um, so this is really meant to be an ins inspirational talk onto what more needs to be done to address how to achieve trustworthy AI. So I am trying to move, there we go. So, before I talk about what I mean by trustworthy AI, I wanna provide the context coming from trustworthy computing. We have spent over two decades doing research in what has been call, called, come to call trustworthy computing. Um, the 
government agencies have put money into this. Industry has put money into this. And of course, academia has been doing research in this area. And the notion of trustworthiness in trustworthy computing has come to mean properties, including reliability, does the system do the right thing? Safety, does it do no harm? Security, how vulnerable is the system to attack? Privacy, does the system protect a person's identity and data? Availability, is the system up when I need to access it? And usability, can a human actually use the system easily? And by computing, it we've come to mean it to be essentially the digital systems we build with hardware and software and the people who use them. From trustworthy computing for trustworthy AI, we need to think of new properties we've never actually had to think about before. So we're upping the ante on already a longstanding research agenda on trustworthy computing by including new properties we have to worry about for AI systems. These properties include accuracy, robustness, fairness, accountability, and so on. More specifically, by accuracy, um, this of course is the gold standard for a lot of machine learning classifiers and predictors. How well does the AI system do on a new set of unseen data, that is data um, that's uh, where the AI system is being deployed, compared to the data on which it was trained and tested. Robustness, how sensitive is the outcome of say a machine learning classifier to a change in the input? Fairness, are the outcomes unbiased? Accountability, who or what is responsible for the outcome? Transparency, is it clear that an external observer um, how, is it clear to an external observer how the system's outcome was produced? And interpretability, explainability, can the system's outcome be justified with an explanation that a human can understand and or that is meaningful to the end user? And we're even talking about ethical concerns of an AI system, something we never had to talk about for a computing system in the past. And Two ethical questions might be, was the data collected in an ethical manner or will the outcome be used in an ethical manner? And because this is really the start of a new research agenda, there may be properties out there that I haven't even identified or the community has yet to identify. So the question is, how can we achieve trustworthy AI with all the properties that we, had, we knew from before with the new properties that make our task even more challenging. And what I wanna posit is just one approach, formal methods, the use of formal specification and verification. But I really want to emphasize that it's just one approach of many that we need collectively to use to achieve trust through the AI. What I wanna do in the remainder of my talk is to explain what it would mean to use formal methods to try to specify and verify AI systems with respect to the kinds of trustworthiness properties we know and love from the past, but the new ones, especially that are challenging today. So in traditional formal verification, um, the, we usually um, aim to show the expression in the red rectangle. It's red, M satisfies P. M stands for a model of the system we want to verify. It could be a piece of code. It could be a protocol, for instance, written as a state machine. Um, it could simply be an abstract model of a concurrent or distributed system. But it is a mathematical object. The double turn style stands for satisfies, and that simply means a logical system that enables us to prove whether a property is true um, of a model of the system M. So, you know, we have studied since the 1980s or even before many logical systems that enable us to do this kind of formal verification. 
Some of these are now embodied in off the shelf tools like model checkers, theorem provers, and SMT solvers. Um, and the combination of the progress made over the 40 decades of research in formal methods have really given us an array and repertoire of verification technology that's basically um, usable and also used in industry. And then P stands for the formalization of the property we want to prove, the trustworthiness property, whether it's a correctness property, like a safety or liveness property um, in a typical computing system, um, or some other kind of property that we care about. So when we, in formal methods, we strive to show that M satisfies P. That's how to read what's in the red, red, red rectangle. From traditional formal verification, oh, and then one other thing I wanna say before I move on to what's new is sometimes in traditional formal verification, we make explicit a model of the environment of the system. In other words, we might have a different mathematical object which captures the behavior of the environment. And so for instance, if E and M are working in parallel, we might say E parallel M satisfies P, um, but E can simply be a model of the environment. Sometimes it stands for the environment of our reactive system, for instance. Um, another way to think about E is a formal cap, um, characterization of the assumptions we make about the environment of say the program P, uh, the program M. So just to give you a concrete idea of what we know and how to do like with our eyes closed is a technique that came out of the eighties called model checking, where you have a concrete state, a model of the system M, it's a finite state machine. You have a property P stated in some kind of temporal logic. And then you have a black box tool that basically shows how to um, determine whether M satisfies P. And the beauty of the model checker is that it will tell you, yes, every behavior of say the finite state machine satisfies the desired property captured by P or no. And not only does it tell you no, it gives you a concrete con counterexample, a single behavior that shows how P is falsified. So that's just one example of an off-the-shelf technology from the 80s that we know and love and we can use. But now, what about verifying AI systems? Um, and before I even go to the complexity of the properties we're trying to uh, verify for AI systems, the properties I listed before, like robustness and fairness, let me first just focus on why AI systems themselves up the ante in the formal verification um, calculation. So now let's reinterpret M satisfies P in this context of AI systems. First, M could be a machine learned model. Um, and think of it as a DNN um, or, or um, you know, your favorite machine learning classifier. Um, of course, in the end, um, although a human being didn't build that model. In the end, that model is a piece of code. What's different, of course, is that a machine generated that code. That's what it means to machine learn the model. But in the end, it's a piece of code. And this gives us hope that the analysis techniques, static dynamic analysis techniques, and including verification techniques, might be useful or usable for the verification of machine learned models. The satisfies has to be reinterpreted, I believe, to embrace the inherent probabilistic nature of these machine learned models. If you think about a DNN, there are probabilities running all over the place, the edges, the outcomes, um, and they're nonlinear functions that are represented by the nodes. So we need new kinds of logics and new kinds of reasoning 
in order to do this proof of satisfaction. And finally, the properties themselves may um, be probabilistic or stochastic in nature. So we are really changing the, or uh, upping the ante, changing the game in terms of the verification question when we're trying to verify a, an AI system with respect to a trustworthy property germane to an AI system. And finally, the most important difference, I believe, between verifying systems of the past and verifying an AI system is the role of data in this expression, in this verification expression. And I call out data explicitly, call, I call it D, and it is analogous to the role of the environment in the old way of our thinking about verification. But I think the role of data and thus the role of the environment is actually even more important than what we know of modeling M, probabilistic and logics and expressing um, properties like fairness or robustness. And this is the real challenge. And I'm gonna get into the role of data a little more uh, shortly. So this is how I characterize the verification challenge for trustworthy AI. DM satisfies P. And what I wanna do is go through each of these elements to explain a little bit more about why these are interesting challenges and why they are new challenges and what new science questions are being, uh, are, are, uh, have to be answered to meet these challenges. So um, as I mentioned, I just, before I dive into that, I just wanna um, state just to capture the two main differences between verifying tr um, trustworthy computing systems of the past and verifying trustworthy AI systems of today and tomorrow. The first is the need for probabilistic reasoning. Um, and that is inherent to the model, to the property, uh, to the data. The second is the role of data. And there are many aspects of this. And I, for, for today, I'm just gonna really spend a lot of time, more, more time on specifying unseen data and what do we quantify or over. So the need for probabilistic reasoning. Um, why do I um, harp on this point? As I mentioned, M is semantically and structurally different from a typical computer program. It's inherently probabilistic. The model itself operates over probabilities and out outputs results with assigned probabilities. And structurally, M is machine generated. It's not human generated. Um, and thus, it's because it's machine generated, it's unlikely to be human readable. I mean, that's the whole idea. The machine generates it, not the human. But in terms of a programming language perspective, this is just, M is just another kind of intermediate code that maybe we can do some interesting analysis on. And finally, the need for probabilistic reasoning is also inherent because what we're trying to reason about is the uncertainty of M's environment. And uncertainties in computing are typically represented as probabilities. That's M. What about P? As I mentioned, P may be formulated over continuous and not just discrete domains and or using expressions from probability and statistics. So for instance, robust, robustness properties for DNNs are characterized as predicates over continuous variables. Fairness properties are characterized in terms of expectations with respect to a loss function over reals. Differential privacy, which is one of the few formalizations of any notion of privacy, is expressed in terms of a difference in probabilities with respect to a small real value, epsilon. So inherently in the expression of P, we have to deal with domains that we hadn't had to deal with explicitly in proving properties of computing systems. And finally, as I mentioned, the logics in which we want to do this reasoning may rely on probabilistic logics or hybrid logics. Um, these need, and 
the good news is that we have probabilistic logics and hybrid logics to build on. Um, and we just need to either scale them or maybe invent new verification techniques. But specifically, these logics need to work over reals, nonlinear functions, probability distributions, stochastic processes, and so on. So as I mentioned, the good news is we actually have a lot of um, past work we can lean on, like hybrid automata. This is work from 1996 in Tom Hensinger's PhD thesis, where he shows that we can uh, reason about um, these kinds of hybrid systems where the, um, the state of the system in, in the circle is represented by um, differential equations and the transitions between the different states are represented as um, Boolean thresholds uh, of, uh, of whether you go from one state to the other. So continuous behavior is captured by the differential equations. The jump condition is simply a Boolean condition. Um, and then we can stay even in variance um, over the states. Another approach, um, instead of a hybrid approach, is to put in one logical system, oh, and then many, many uh, tools have been built based on hybrid automata and hybrid reasoning. A different approach by my former colleague at Carnegie Mellon, Andre Plotzer, um, is to put in one logical system the ability to talk about both uh, continuous and discrete variables and um, behavior. Um, and so I'm just showing here a snippet of what can be expressed in terms of a hybrid program. You can see that there's symbolic ways to represent um, differentiation, um, but also how you can um, write certain properties that you want of this hybrid program, that's the P, um, in terms of what looks essentially like temporal logic. And again, this logic and the, uh, the tools that he has built and set subsequently since the um, uh, early uh, uh, 2008 um, have been shown to uh, verify uh, the safety properties of um, a, a cyber physical systems, the kinds of systems that audience cares a lot about in terms of air traffic control and cars not uh, crashing into each other. And finally, I mentioned already the need uh, for probabilistic reasoning because in the end, we also have to reason about the uncertainty of an environment for a computing system like a robot or a car, but also about uncertainty in the data um, that we might use in when we're deploying a an AI system. And there are many probabilistic um, ways of reasoning about uncertainty using probabilistic automata, or probabilistic model checking, probabilistic logics, and there are even probabilistic programming languages. For instance, here's one uh, that looks like a little like C, but it has a, a notion of a random variable, which you can say flip a coin and draw on a distribution for the value. Um, and the observed statement tells you which value you observe after you flip the coin. So now let me get to um, the role of D, which I think is really perhaps the most intellectually challenging um, uh, question, especially for the formal methods community. So um, I want to carry, um, I, I want to, some informal definitions here. I use the term available data to mean the data at hand, the data we have, used for training and testing in our same machine learning system. And then I use the term unseen data for the data over which the model needs to uh, operate without having seen it before. That's the whole idea of, of building a machine learning system so that you can build it on some data so that it will work in data it hasn't seen before. So first there's the issue of collecting and partitioning data. This is pretty, um, a bread and butter at this point. How do we partition an available given data set into a training set and a test set? What guarantees can we make of this partition with respect to a desired property a P in building a model M? Um, how much data suffices to build a model M for a given property? 
Does adding more data to a tr to train or test and make it more robust or fair, or does it not? Does it not have an effect at all? Um, and it would be nice to know more formally what these limitations are and what these capabilities are. Um, and then what happens if a desired property doesn't hold? Then what new kind of data do we need to go out and collect and retrain our model with? Uh, specifying unseen data. Uh, this is actually, um, I think, the, technically the, the conundrum that I puzzle over the most. So first, there's a the question of how do we specify the data or, and or characterize properties of the data? Um, we could specify D as a stochastic process or data distribution. For instance, for normal distribution via the uh, mean and variance, via the parameters, uh, we could use a probabilistic programming language. So for instance, Dan is probably the most well-used probabilistic programming language in the world. Um, and it's used in industry and government, and of course in academia, especially for specifying statistical models used in science and engineering applications. But what of the large real world data sets that don't fit into common statistical models or which have thousands of parameters that you can't even think about writing a, a program for. That's a challenge. Um, here's another challenge, and this is the one I puzzle over, which is breaking the circular reasoning. So to specify unseen data, we need to make certain assumptions about the unseen data. Would those assumptions then not be the very same we would make to build the Model M in the first place? In other words, we need to trust the specification of D. The whole point of DM satisfies P up here is to ensure some trust in M. But in order to ensure some trust in M, we have to make some assumptions about D. But then what, are they not the very same assumptions um, we would be making about trusting M? So it seems like circular reasoning. So how do we break the circular reasoning? One approach is to actually use an alternative way, say from statistics, um, to validate some properties of D. Uh, another is to assume that the initial specification of D is small and simple enough that we can check it, say, manually, um, and then use this manually checked small specification to bootstrap an iterative refinement process um, to build up a larger and larger model or, or specification of D. This is akin to the counterexample guided abstraction and refinement process that we know and love in formal methods and that has proven to be hugely useful to handle essentially um, unbounded state spaces in traditional computing systems. So I don't have a real answer to this. I'm just raising these questions as a part of the scientific agenda for achieving trustworthy AI. And then of course, how does the specification of unseen data relate to the specification of the data on which M was trained and tested? Now, there's another um, a, a fine point I wanted to make with respect to the verification of a trustworthiness property for AI systems. And that is, what do we even quantify over? So in traditional formal methods, we strive to prove a, for all X, P of X. For instance, for a program, we might prove for all values of a variable, some property P holds. The, the, the program does the right thing. Or for a concurrent and distributed system, we might say for all behaviors of the model of this concurrent or distributed system, my de desired property P holds. But if, if the quantification is for all X, but for AI systems, we do not expect M to work for all input data or for all data sets D. We can't hope to prove or for all X or maybe someone will prove me wrong. But right now my belief is we can't hope to prove a for all X. Uh, we can't hope to have a universal quantification 
over the x in the the variables uh, the 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 variables in the property expressed by P. So what can we do? Well, I argue that we might be able to come close to something in between. So instead of say, saying for all X P of X, let's divide the specification of um, for all X P of X into two parts. One is the property specification at, uh, itself P, um, and the other is what we quantify over. And you know, for some properties, it might be that you are able to prove for a given data set, I can show this property holds. And that's all you want. So then you're actually golden. And for other uh, data sets, you actually might be able, and properties, you might be able to show for all X, although the, it's likely, unlikely that one can. What one can think about doing is to draw on distributions and prove that, say, for a robustness, um, any um, X drawn from a particular distribution um, that um, that property holds. Um, and for fairness, we might say for a given distribution, that property holds. Um, so, what I argue is perhaps there's an intermediate ground um, where we might say for any distribution in a class of distributions, we can show that property holds. Um, and so it may be that instead of um, for robustness, what we, we usually argue today is say for any arbitrary norm bound and perturbation, um, and concretely, that means change any pixel you want in the image, and I guarantee that the machine learning classifier will still say it's a, it's a stop sign. Um, maybe we want different kinds of classes of distributions over which we would want to say for all D in that class. So an example for robustness is, in, in fact, we want to be able to, to say for certain tasks, we want semantic perturbations to be, um, we want the machine learning classifier to be um, robust with respect to semantic perturbations. So a semantic perturbation might be, if you have a dent in the car, um, it's still a car. So you wanna classify it as a car. You don't wanna say it's not a car just because there's a dent in the car. Um, now that is germane to the task of computer vision for say a self-driving car. It's not what you would want um, if you're in a repair shop and you actually want to distinguish between a car with a dent and a car without a dent. On the other extreme is fairness where we know how to prove um, a for a particular data set whether a classifier is fair or not for a given notion of fairness. But what we don't know how to do is uh, as easily is to show for multiple data sets, whether a machine, classify, machine learning classifier is fair or not. So this is of active um, research right now. What we'd like to be able to say is for nearby distributions, this um, machine learning classifier is fair. And a typical example is when you do something like hiring or college admissions, um, you use historical data to train your machine learning model. Um, that historical data is based on the population of students who applied or people who applied for the job. Um, but we want to be able to be fair for the future, for future populations of students who apply to a college or um, a, a talent to apply for the jobs. And in particular, in this day and age, we know uh, that a lot of these machine learning classifiers are unfair with, um, because our, the, the data that we're using to train the models are uh, historically biased. So what do we quantify over? Um, just to give you a concrete example for robustness, I already talked about, um, you know, a, the kind of, I would say, the standard notions of robustness where you add a little noise and you can fool the machine learning classifier. 
Um, and I think what we need is to strive for notions of robustness that will allow us to um, say that a machine learning classifier is robust with, with respect to semantic or structural perturbations at the for the task at hand. For example, computer vision for self-driving cars. And then for robustness and fairness, um, there's some work that my colleagues and I did to show that, in fact, if you build a fair classifier, it's very easy to uh, show that it's not robust. In fact, what we did was we took uh, canonical data sets, built the fairest classifier we could given state-of-the-art uh, machine learning techniques for different notions of fairness. And we very slightly reweighted the coefficients of the data distributions, if you will, input data distributions. And we show it was very easy to make a fair classifier become unfair. So that were brittle um, classifiers. What we did in this paper that was published in NeurIPS a couple um, years ago is to use an online algorithm, two-player two game algorithm, to build a cl fair classifier that's actually robust to a class of distributions. So you can perturb the coefficients of the input distributions by a certain amount and still and be reassured that the fair classifier remains fair, robust within that class. So now let me turn to the double turnstile, the verification task. And the questions here are, how do we check that the available data, um, how do we check the available data for the desired properties? Um, is, it, is there a way that we can detect whether a data set is fair or not? Um, what should we even be checking of the data set? If we detect that the property doesn't hold, how do we fix the model or amend the property or decide what new data to collect? Um, and interestingly, what is the equivalent of a counterexample in the verification of an ML model? And how do we use it? We know that the value of formal methods in industry in the past few decades has not been that we've been able to declare a system is correct a system is secure, but rather when we go through the process of trying to prove a system is correct, we come up with these counterexamples that help us debug our systems to make them more correct, if you will. So what is the equivalent of that process for AI systems? Um, how do we exploit the explicit specification of unseen data to aid in the verification test? That is the explicit for explicit specification of D in my four element um, expression. And then how can we extend standard verification techniques to operate over data distributions, perhaps taking advantage of the ways in which we formally specify unseen data? Um, I wanted to share one example of a verification technique called interval analysis um, that has been used by some colleagues of mine in here at Columbia to show how you can prove a robustness property of a DNN that does image classification. Um, so they work over these nonlinear functions in the nodes of the DNN. Um, it's very efficient. There's a sound over approximation and it's highly parallelizable. Uh, this result that I'm showing you already is a few years old. Um, but at the time, it was over 200 times faster than using SMT approaches. And this is why I think new verification approaches are needed for these kinds of AI systems. And interval analysis is just one example. And my colleagues have shown how to use this te technique for proving safety and security properties on autonomous vehicles, aircraft control, and even malware. I won't go through the technique. Um, I also want to just pop up a level and say, I've been fixing, fix, yeah, I, I've been focused primarily on a very traditional notion of formal methods where you have a specification, you have a, a model, and you want to do a verification of the specification with respect to the property. 
um, uh, this verification of the model with respect to the specification. Obviously, there are other opportunities for formal methods more generally. Um, I mentioned being uh, task specific. So we might say, well, the task for seeing the car in front of me um, and saying it is a car, even though there's a dent in it, is very different from the task of repairing the car that's in the uh, that, that where the, the car has a dent in it. Um, another opportunity for formal methods is a whole different approach, which we like to call correct by construction. So rather than post facto verification, we actually construct a machine learning model or machine learn model um, uh, step by step with each step ensuring that at the end, that model satisfies the original desired trustworthy property. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. And then there are canonical outstanding formal methods approaches where you wanna use compositional reasoning. And without compositional reasoning, I don't think we would have made such progress in formal methods on proving properties of concurrent and distributed systems. Um, and finally, um, what I hinted at only earlier is that there are a repertoire of statistical methods for model evaluation and model checking. And if there's any other point I wanna make is that the computer science community has to be talking with the statistics community a lot more. And so we can incorporate the kinds of methods that they have invented over the, the, the decades um, into the kind of techniques that we have been using um, in our own systems, our own verification approaches. So as an example of a robust by construction, um, a different colleague of mine here at uh, Columbia uh, showed how to construct um, a DNN that would be robust against certain perturbations to uh, input images. So this is the uh, canonical problem where you, uh, you know, put duct tape on the stop sign and out it says it's a yield sign. So what they do is um, inspired by the notion of differential privacy, which is to add a layer of noise in the DNN. And because you can control where you put this layer and what kind of noise you add, you can then fine tune how much robustness you want at the end, at the output. So by adding a layer of noise, and they found that adding it as a second layer is the, the best for this particular application, you can basically um, guarantee a certain a degree of robustness around certain input perturbations. Um, and that basically says it's a provable guarantee. And that's quite a strong statement. So I'm gonna close and just say, this is what I mean by trustworthy AI meets formal methods. Thank you very much. Dr. Bing, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I, I, um... I listened to your talk before, and I still I think today I still learned something new from you. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, and I want to uh, remind the audience: if you have a question, you can put your question in the chat box or Q and A, and I will read your question to Professor Bing. And um, I, I'm going to start with my own questions. And uh, I, I, you mentioned your notion of this. Uh, uh, I am Intel P or D am Intel P, and you also have this notion of environment uh, uh, M and, and also am Intel P. For I, I want to connect this to automated vehicles, and for automated vehicle, um, it's not sometimes it's not only supervised learning. There's also reinforcement learning associated with it, and particularly um, for us, in order for us to verify and train. Uh, automated vehicles, the environment become also very important. Yeah. So, um, so I wonder whether um, eventually for the autonomous vehicles is 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 actually gonna be uh, D and and then E and then M entails P. Yeah, it's a great question, and I I obviously simplified um, things 
I think I, I want to say two things. First of all, it makes perfect sense to have E comma D comma M satisfies P. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and actually by differentiating between E and D, we, we say, you know, E is like another like state machine, let's say. And yeah. D is like data. So we would express data very differently. So that makes perfect sense to me. I was just really, you know, partly just simplifying the presentation. Mm -hmm. But I also want to say another thing, and this is really to um, a tip my hat to my colleague, Sanjeev Sashia at Berkeley, who has um, built a little verification AI system. I, I think it's even called Very AI or something like that, specifically for verifying the safety of autonomous vehicles. So, but it's it's very it's a very different approach. He basically has a simulation environment. So that's your E. Exactly. And then for any behavior that you simulate for E, he can stick in a, a, a model of the self-driving car and verify robustness. Now he's not getting, but he he has the the system he's verifying has inside it a machine learned, say, vision system. But he makes the whole system a black box. So he's not actually verifying anything specific to the machine learned subcomponent. He's verifying what I think this audience cares <laughs> perhaps even more about. It's the whole car. You want as a system, you want to make sure the car, which happens to have a machine learning vision system, um, behaves properly in a um, a in a real environment as simulated by the the behaviors you uh, generate in your in your simulation system. But it's it's a it's a very it's a it's a sound approach because once you have a black box. You could put anything in that black box, right? And then all you need to describe is the interaction between, you know, the behavior of the black box and the environment. So it's a good first step because it first says, well, okay, I have guaranteed that for every simulation my environment generated, this black box will be safe and secure or whatever it is. However, then once you go inside the black box, then you're still left with the question of, well, what about that vision system? Suppose I, um, suppose I put in a different vision system tomorrow. Um, wouldn't it be nice to know that I don't have to re-simulate? You know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions that, that yeah. has to do with compositionality and so on. But you're, you're, I, I wanted to point out that I had, a, in some said, a very narrow approach to the verification question only because I honed in on, I think, on what is the, the new hard part. Yep. Uh, yep. And that's not to say that doing a black box verification using a simulation environment is not useful. I would imagine that every uh, company in your audience does that. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, that's what. Yeah, exactly. I, I, no one, no, no customer is going to buy any of those cars without having some kind of certification that the company has has done that. Same thing with Boeing. I mean, they must do that for other airplanes. Exactly. So, so I I, I want to add to what you just said. Um, it's the, uh, one thing is that for autonomous vehicles, is um, it's for particularly for the planning um, aspect of uh, autonomous vehicles. I think, in fact, the simulation environment, the training for the simulation environment is as difficult as training the autonomous vehicle itself. Um, what I mean by that is that um, in, in order to generate that more realistic you know, environment so that you can really train an autonomous vehicle and so that you can, you have to do a really good job for that environment training. The other thing is that to to be more effective, um, to accelerate in terms of your training and testing, um, your environment has to be intelligent enough to adapt to what happening with the autonomous vehicle as well, so that you can generate um, you know intelligent scenarios to sort of to 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 test or train this uh, automated vehicle. So that's why. Um, so the data is not only just supporting 
the M is actually the data is supporting the D, the E as well. So that's what that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just raised another challenge, but by by making explicit the difference between E and D, mm -hmm. now you have you are able to articulate more crisply a new scientific challenge. So that I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> part, part of my goal in yeah. writing my little paper was to give us a vocabulary to express mm -hmm. these questions. Exactly, exactly. I really like your, you know, simplified notation of that and then uh, give me the tool so that I can write down what, what, uh, you well, know, what I people can ask. Well, I did not use Greek letters. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right. Okay, so I, I have other questions, but I, let me read the question from the, the chat box. Um, how do you see the importance of extendability, uh, explain it, excellent, extend, explain the explainability <laughs> being implemented within the bond of the fairness? Um, so I'm not sure whether the question is how does explainability and fairness um, you know, uh, I, I, let, let, me, let me take a crack at what could be being asked. First of all, I think explainability is important uh, for the end user. And one of the hesitations that I find many of my colleagues, especially in the medical school, um, but practicing clinicians, as you can imagine, um, in using sophisticated AI is that they, don't know why, they don't know, they don't have an explanation of why did the classifier say this versus that? Um, and they need to trust the system. They need some kind of explanation. Um, and, you know, even, even saying 0.9, uh, maybe that gives you a warmer feeling than 0.7, um, but it would be good if there was some explanation that went along with the 0.9. And I'm thinking about the end user, the, clin the clinician. Now, um, in terms of explainability and fairness, that, that actually raises all sorts of new interesting um, combinations. I think, ex I think the, the problem with fairness, and I've been thinking about this trustworthy AI issue uh, long enough to to say at this point, I think fairness is the most difficult property. Um, and, and the reason is first, we uh, all sorts of reasons. First of all, we know that it's very easy to formalize different notions of fairness. But in fact, we also know that, you know, take say two of those very common notions of fairness, like statistical parity and, um, and, um, I can't even remember the other one that that I, I that I usually use, um, and we can show that there's no um, system that can satisfy both notions of fairness at the same time. So that's an impossibility result. It came out of the Compass work um, when the academics, you know, got their hands on the data and showed that um, you know for one notion of fairness the tool was doing okay, but for a different notion of fairness, it was biased and you can't build a tool that can satisfy both, both notions of fairness. So that, like, that really um, was very, very unsatisfying because even, I, I, hate to, you, I hate to confound the issue, but even in computer science, um, many, many years ago, we actually did talk about fairness. We talked about it in the context of fair scheduling. You know, making sure that every process got their turn at um, accessing a particular resource. And we were formal and we could prove fairness. And we had all sorts of de demonic fairness, angelic. We had everything all laid out beautifully. But for fairness, when it comes to human beings, it's not, it's not so clear cut. And just because we can formalize a notion doesn't mean we actually have built something that is fair. <laughs> I mean, from an interpretation of a human being or society or social norms. So, so fairness, I think, is really, really hard. Um, now, that's not to say we can't make progress on formal notions of fairness. It just says that we need to understand the limitations 
of what our verification system is doing with respect to some formal notion of fairness. It's not the be all and end all. Now, that's a long way to, to try to answer this question of explainability and fairness. Um, I think they are separably difficult and you've asked me to put them together and say how could they work together or maybe there's a trade-off between the two. I, I don't really know. Yeah, I, we are all, we are two o'clock, but I have one question. I think it's an interesting question I want to ask you. The question says, thank you for your very interesting talk. And I have a question on the measurement and assessment of trustworthiness. What's the good way to measure the trustworthiness? Trust might mean different thing, different, differently to different agents. Does it, does it require a centralized agent to supervise or institute an overall norm of trustworthiness? Okay, there are two questions in that. One is about measurement. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have good answer to that, but I do know that um, there's a lot of interest in metrics mm -hmm. and measurement. And in fact, there was a workshop on trustworthy AI or some, some similar title that was sponsored by NIST specifically to say, what are some metrics that we can all agree on that we can then hold up a system to and say, how trustworthy is it you know, for some property? So I don't have answers to that, but it's a good question. Um, but the other, the other part of that question was about who, who determines, um, you know, is it a collective decision on what is trustworthy or is there's a central authority that says, you need to pass my judgment. Um, uh, it's a good question. It, I, it, it may very well be that you have, a, you know, it, it, for a particular property, um, there's a court you go to and you prove to the court and the court is this neutral party that says, yes, uh, you're trustworthy or no, you're not. Or it may be consensus building. Um, and we have seen in computing systems, uh, properties where, you know, uh, that are not local and you need kind of a global view of the system to say once and for all, uh, the, it, the, the database is serializable, for instance, um, but you also have local properties like a linearizability where you can do these proofs individually and then you know that the whole system is linearizable. Mm -hmm. We are not close to any of that for AI systems, but that's the kind of thinking we do need. Um, and I, I, that's why I really like this question because it actually raised two very important questions. So thank very, you very much. Very I, good. I, I'm very, very happy to speak to this audience. And thank I have you. to go to another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay, you bye. very much. Thank you. Bye.